Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing water rights and access to clean water for Native Americans on tribal lands with special guests, John Echohawk, Executive Director of the Native American Rights Fund, who has been representing American Indian tribes in their water right claims for more than 50 years, and George McGraw, founder and CEO of Dig Deep, which is dedicated to providing clean water, running water to all Americans, including the Navajo Nation. So, John, it's great to see you again. It always is. You know, I, I sit at your feet and learn about a world that I have only touched tangentially. And it's such an honor to, to uh, be able to benefit from, from your experience um, as, as a man of, of European descent, um, it's, it's really important for me to understand the uh, impact that, um, that my forebears um, have had on yours and to try and, and find a way to together build uh, a much better um, and more just society and we're going to be talking about water rights in that context. Water is so important, uh, particularly throughout the United States. And I had not been aware until very recently uh, the impact that, um, that our history has had on Native tribes and access to water. Could you, could you help me to understand better uh, the situation that you face in Indian country? Yes. Uh, well, as, as, uh, as you know, Mark, it's... Uh, uh, very important uh, out here in the West, where uh, water is scarce, to have uh, uh, access to water and uh, rights to water, because uh, um, you, you know you just can't survive, you know, without uh, without the water. And so uh, the issues are really important to tribes. There are so many tribes out west, and uh, fortunately, they've got. Uh, substantial rights to water. And that's what we've been uh, helping them with for, uh, for the last 52 years here at the Native American Rights Fund, the National Indian Legal Defense Fund. What is the source of those rights? Uh, uh, um, are those rights embedded in past treaties that were forged with the various nations? Well, it all stems from a United States Supreme Court decision in 1908 that uh, for the first time, addressed uh, tribal water rights. And the uh, Supreme Court in that case um, uh, dealt with a situation where uh, the uh, Indians on the reservation were not getting uh, water uh, that they needed because it was being diverted upstream by non-Indians. And so the court had to decide uh, who had the rights. And the court, uh, the court basically uh, held that uh, uh, tribes had the senior rights that uh, under their uh, uh, treaty, um, even though it didn't say specifically anything about water, uh, the uh, treaty impliedly reserved uh, water for present and future uses uh, for the Indians because uh, without water, you know, the reservation would be useless. So surely there must have been uh, water reserved uh, by Congress when it uh, passed the treaty, even though the treaty didn't say anything specific about it. So this is known as the, as, uh, uh, the Winter's Doctrine Reserve Rights for Tribes that were established at the time the uh, reservation was created. And and we've been uh, uh, is, is representing tribes to uh, quantify, figure out exactly how much water that is. And, and what, one thing that really struck me, I, I was talking with uh, someone who represents a major part of the American uh, farming industry and ranching industry. And he basically said the following, which I thought was very interesting. He said, you know, when you, when you have a vegetable, when you have a piece of fruit, when you look at a steak, what you're basically looking at from a Western point of view is water is water, right? It's water in a, in a tangible form. The food is, is grown by water. It's actually, it's money, it's life, it's value. And so, it, so before the Supreme Court decision, there was a taking of value, taking of life 
in this respect as well. And George, you're focused on providing access to that life-giving um, thing that we all need on a daily basis. So uh, talk a little bit about how you approach this, this issue once the rights are established. Yes, you're absolutely right. Good morning, Mark. Nice to see you, John. Um, really excited to talk about this today. It's, it's World Water Day um, being celebrated all over the world. And, you know, John pointed out the Winters Doctrine. I, I wish, Mark, that that had been, you know, the end of the problem, um, that tribal water rights had been respected from there on out. But unfortunately, you know, in this country and in others, there are these legacies of broken treaties and unrecognized rights and tribes really having to step up to the plate, often with fewer resources than states or the federal government to defend um, their rights, even the ones that are explicitly recognized in treaties. Um, but basically, you know, what we have today is a situation in which there are millions, more than 2.2 million people in the U.S. who don't have access to running water or a flush toilet. 2.2 um, million people. Yeah, there exactly. Is, are those uh, regionally um, uh, focused? Uh, and, and talk a little bit about the dimensions that, that, um, that hit Native Americans. Yeah. So our organization, digdeep.org, and the U.S. Water Alliance released a report in 2019, and it was the first effort to try to quantify, you know, this population, where they live, to understand the drivers of the problem. And we found that these 2.2 million folks, which is likely an undercount, live in all 50 states, but that race is the strongest predictor of whether or not you and your family will have a tap or a toilet in your house. And, um, you know, to, to us on this call, it would be unsurprising to know that Native Americans, Indigenous folks are 19 times more likely than white families not to have running water today. If you're Black or Latino, you're twice as likely. And so the largest concentrations of, uh, you know, folks that we have without running water are Alaska Natives, um, Native Americans living in Arizona, in New Mexico. <clears throat> um, but really, this does affect, you know, Native and non-Native folks in all 50 states. But you know, native reservations have been hit the hardest. Um, we work on the Navajo Nation, which is the largest reservation. It's in the Southwest. And, you know, they're almost 30 percent of folks don't have running no, water. Almost a third of people don't have access to uh, running water, John. Um, and 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 that is just it's just insane. And, and it's all defined by race. Yes, it is. And uh, uh, we've. Uh, done our best here uh, over 52 years to uh, help tribes uh, quantify their rights under the uh, winner's doctrine such that then they would have uh, uh, access to that water. It would be wet water, not paper water, which, you know, the, the, the paper says it was implied, uh, impliedly reserved for them, but uh, exactly how much that is. And then to put that to use, that's a whole nother problem that's a whole nother situation and uh, we've made a lot of progress on that uh, but still uh, there's more more tribes more work to do and george how do you actually bridge that gap because you're talking about logistics you're talking about technology you're talking about engineering so describe that and describe the teams because also you want to create self-sufficiency as well you don't want to create codependency and frankly the tribes are are uh, very cautious, justifiably, from any codependent relationship. So talk about um, how you go about the logistics of, 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 uh, of creating a solution. Absolutely. So, so John's absolutely right. We, our job is to take those, those paper rights and turn them into wet rights and actually get this water into people's homes where they can use it. Um, and that is an effort that, you know, we do alongside tribal governments and tribal utilities themselves. But we really focus on usually those really remote or hard to serve homes that are outside of existing infrastructure. So you know, the tribal government is often focused on extending, you know, utility lines to service as many people as possible or making those systems more robust, using money from water rights settlements, using new water as it comes into the system as they win these settlements. We really focus on the fringes, bringing hot and cold running water and sanitation to folks in remote areas. Um, one of those efforts of ours is the Navajo Water Project. Um, and that is a completely indigenous-led effort. It's led by my colleague, um, Emma Robbins, who's Diné herself. Um, actually, all of our projects doing infrastructure work around the country um, are led by directors and managers from the communities they serve and employ people from within that community to and build you know, jobs Basically, and economic wealth. Basically, the deciders on the ground, deciders on the ground are the people on the ground. 
<laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah, that's why I have the time to be with you here today <laughs> because I'm not on the ground making those decisions. So, um, in terms of so, so you create these teams, you're you're creating these projects. Can you talk a little bit about the the uh, subject matter expertise beyond the project management side and the on the ground side? There's technology involved, right? I mean, uh, uh, water. Uh, creating this this infrastructure um, requires uh, some things that you couldn't train me today to to learn in, in in a short period of time. How do you assemble those teams? You'd be surprised what you can learn on YouTube, Mark. Um, but uh, <laughs> no, well, yeah, that's this, a very this is good a little. Point. It's a yeah, very I good mean, point, right? Yeah, there there are certainly and and you know that's that is part of our job. Water is so multifaceted. I think there's part of this. It's about deploying technology, and we have a host of you know, plumbers and pipe fitters and solar technicians and engineers on board. And, you know, they're focused on deploying these systems. We, we build off-grid systems where in remote homes that can't be reached by water lines, we'll install systems that store thousands of gallons of water underground safely that we might deliver by truck, for instance, using a network of community truck drivers. And then we'll use solar power to pump that water into the house and to heat it and to pressurize it into you know, sinks and showers and toilets. In some places, we help the utility um, reach out to and hook up families who are close to utility lines, but might not have the time or the resources um, or the expertise to know, you know, how to get in that line and what paperwork to put forward and how to finalize that, that transaction. Um, in some cases, we're building, you know, septic and, and sanitation systems. People might have already have running water, but not have the infrastructure in their house to have a toilet, for instance. Um, I think one of the coolest things we do, to, to my point about YouTube, uh, we have a, a new partnership with IATMO, which is the big plumbing code writing organization in the U.S., and with Navajo Technical University. And um, we uh, just during COVID built a, a plumbing and pipe fitting training lab that will train and graduate the first class of Navajo plumbers and pipe fitters. And if they go through this program uh, for, for a year and a half, they'll get a certificate that allows them to do plumbing and pipe fitting work on the nation. Um, and they'll use Dig Deep's um, Navajo water project as sort of a living classroom out in the field. And then with that certificate, they can either continue to practice plumbing and pipe fitting on the Navajo Nation, where, to my knowledge right now, uh, in an area the size of the state of West Virginia, there's only one licensed Navajo plumber. Every, everyone else has to find a plumber, often a non-native plumber, from off the reservation to come do that work if they can. Um, and with that certificate, they can work on the nation or they can apprentice with one of the national plumbing unions in any state um, and build a really valuable business. I mean, the trades are so under-resourced in the U.S., but so essential moving forward, especially in the face of climate change. And this is an incredible opportunity for you know young Indigenous folks to step up and build build wealth. Um, John, could you give us a little bit of an insight into how um, the civil society uh, within diverse tribes work? And I know that it's an unfair question because there's so many different nations, and there's so many different approaches, so many different people. Um, and so on. But, um, you know, we're we're outsiders. I'm an outsider. And we have um, my experience has been I, I've worked with um, with foundations, tribal foundations. I've worked with uh, tribal governments. I've worked with uh, with nonprofits. Uh, give us a sense of of how um, people come together, different groups of people um, within a tribe or across tribes to uh, forge a productive relationship that leads to self-sufficiency and uh, in a way that is determined by the people themselves. Is, is, is there, is there a, a lot of discussion and interaction and debate? Are people um, individually taking flyers or all of the above? No, this is uh, uh, an issue that's uh, very important to tribes. Uh, we have uh, uh, a symposium on tribal water rights settlements uh, every two years okay. to bring everybody up to speed on uh, uh, all the latest developments. And it's always really very well attended by tribes because tribes know that they all have these reserve water rights under the winner's doctrine. And they're all uh, working together to get those uh, rights quantified through, uh, through litigation or settlements. And everybody's on the same page. And we've, uh, really come a long way since uh, since the 70s when uh, all this uh, litigation started under our, our leadership. And uh, there are 34 congressionally approved water rights settlements. Uh, we've been involved in uh, nine of those at the Native American Rights Fund. And there are currently 
20 sets of negotiations underway to uh, quantify the reserve rights under the Winters Doctrine and uh, tribes are universally in support of the settlement policy. And uh, the administration of Congress knows that very well. That tri- uh, how do very- the different peoples and negotiators handle the non-federally recognized tribes versus the federally recognized tribes? Because there's a different set of, of issues, right? For, for those that are federally versus non-federally recognized? Yes, that's right. That's right. So how, do, how, how does that, how do the, the federally recognized, because the federally, rec, my understanding is the federally recognized tribes have more leverage, and particularly if there are particular treaties involved. But my understanding is that um, as a group that, um, that very often these, uh, the rights of the federally recognized tribes are also leveraged to try and support in certain respects, um, the aspirations of the non-federally recognized tribes. Am I getting that incorrect? I know that there are there are people involved, so there are politics involved and different views and so on. Um, how does that, that function um, in, in a way that supports everyone's aspirations? Well, of course, uh, the federal government owes uh, no trust responsibility to the non-federally recognized tribes. So they're basically on their own. They're in a different... Uh, a different mode than uh, than the uh, federally recognized tribes, and uh, uh, it's it's just really uh, not anything that uh, we're working on. Uh, and I, I just really don't think there's a whole lot of conflict there in the water rights field between the federally recognized and the non-recognized. Okay. So um, we just completed a poll. We, we asked, what is the most critical factor in determining water access in the U.S.? And we, we had uh, race and ethnicity got 38 percent of the uh, response. Income um, got some response, uh, a little bit above 10 percent. But all of the above, race, ethnicity, income and location um, were viewed as as intersecting issues. Uh, um how do you how do you feel about this, George, in terms of income? You know, our income in this country so often correlates to ethnicity, right? Average incomes for different peoples um, are very much correlated to race. Is this an income issue? Is it a location issue? Is it an all of the above issue or is it a race issue? It is an all of the above issue, but sort of um, in order of precedence, it's race, then income, then location. And you're right. That why, is really it, why is it race first? Well, I think, you know, if you look at the history of how we invested in water infrastructure in this country, starting with the New Deal in the 1930s, we made massive investments to bring water and sanitation services. Tennessee to, Valley Authority, right? Yeah. Even the most rural parts of this country. Um, we had, in fact, a, a federal authority that was just set up to serve rural populations of a thousand people or less. Of course, you know, what you don't read in the history books is that those were set up to serve predominantly white rural populations. And the idea was that we would eradicate cholera and other waterborne illnesses and support farmers. But those investments either deliberately or accidentally, in some cases, you know, bypassed places like native reservations and communities of color. Sometimes Black those communities farmers, of color, uh, Latino oh my farmers God, yeah. did not get the same consideration. That's exactly right. In fact, there was a really interesting article in 2019 in the New York Times about um, a farm town in California. Um, A lot of um, free black slave families had moved from southern plantation states out to California to start a new life and and have a new opportunity. But Jim Crow beat them here. And so they settled, you know, unable to live in the center of these farm towns. They settled their own neighborhoods on the side of these farm towns, often, you know, across the tracks on the other side of the tracks. And when the federal government came in and built water infrastructure, um, they didn't build it to serve these predominantly black communities. And now what you have today is most of those black families have left and been replaced by Latino farm working families. And in some towns in California, you still have parts of that town that have running water being the predominantly white and traditionally white parts and other you know, whole neighborhoods simply not being served. And um, that's you know, in 2022. Now, how does that work in terms of the intersection of, of politics? Because if if uh, wealth correlates to race and services mm-hmm. correlates to influence, uh, voters theoretically can can shift influence. Um, is, is there an issue here in terms of of how do we communicate with with the government that nonprofits can fill? 
by finessing that communication and providing solutions that are not necessarily coming directly from the government, George? Well, I mean, you have to remember that in the case of Native Americans, Indigenous folks couldn't vote until the 1960s. Um, so there, there was no power at the poll box to get um, politicians to pay attention. You know, and often, you know, Indigenous reservations tend to be, you know, less dense population-wise and sort of more economically depressed than other regions because of policies like this one. And that leads to a situation where, you know, not only are families, you know, forgotten and marginalized, but even if they want to participate in processes like that, they often have much bigger daily needs to think about. You know, if you wake up, Mark, every morning thinking, how will I get enough water for my family to survive the day just to simply do the activities that I have planned today? Um, it's difficult to think about how to exert influence on someone, you know, half a continent away. And I think that on one of my first trips to Navajo, I met this woman named Brenda Johnson, um, who I'm still friends with. And, you know, her family didn't have running water. And I rode a water truck, this woman named Darlene Arviso, this Navajo school bus driver who would deliver water after her morning bus route. And when we got to Brenda's house, she grabbed the cooking pot, filled it with water, ran into the kitchen and started making tamales. I was like, oh, this is so nice. Are you going to have people over for dinner? And she said, no, I, I'm going to make these tamales with this clean water. I'm going to put them in this cooler. I'm going to walk down the hill with my little license and I'm going to sell them. And I use that money to get gas money. And I need gas money because my husband, who's the primary breadwinner, he was injured in an accident 50 miles away in Gallup. And we couldn't care for his wound at home. So it got gangrene and he's been in the hospital for two weeks. But actually, you know, he was discharged 10 days ago and has been living on the streets because no clean water meant no gas money and no gas money meant no tamales and no, I'm sorry, no tamales meant no gas money and no gas money meant I couldn't go get my husband. And you see how this sort of cycle of economic marginalization, you know, has impacted now generations of indigenous folks um, and left them in this situation we're in today. John, um, when you, when you have people who are, who are trying to serve uh, who are white, uh, witness this and and uh, bring this awareness. Um, what is are, are we doing the right thing? Are we approaching this uh, properly? Can we do more? Uh, and how what could we do more to create the America that we imagine that we live in? Well, we uh, came together um, recently with uh, the passage of this bipartisan infrastructure bill in Congress, and it provided $2.5 billion to fund these tribal water rights settlements that had not been completely funded yet. $2.5 billion, that was huge. Plus another, uh, I think it was $22 million altogether, I mean $22 billion altogether for uh, uh, clean water programs on reservations. So uh, all of that uh, is finally um, uh, appropriated. The money's supposed to start flowing. You start starting to basically fulfill the water rights settlements and to uh, provide uh, uh, safe drinking water uh, on a lot of the reservations. So this is just starting. It took a long time to get their attention, but uh, they came through. You know, it strikes me that that in uh, in forging these uh, agreements in past history with the nations, often under duress, it created the foundation for um, other people to build wealth. But um, there was a, an agreement uh, for that. There was a quid pro quo, but it seems like it was always quid, 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 right? In other words, uh, continued extraction. This is basically fulfilling an agreement and exchange uh, instead of just taking to fulfill the other part of the bargain, isn't it? Yeah, we've uh, always had difficulty getting uh, the appropriations we need uh, for uh, uh, these uh, water issues. But uh, again, recently we have done pretty well, but it's been a long time in coming. And are the nations going to be administering the money that is set aside? Because we also have a history of money being set aside and then being administered outside of the nations, taking away the decision making over the resources that are being allocated. How is it working now? Well, it's, it's just starting to, uh, to happen now. And uh, the tribes very much uh, are involved in that process and uh, are seeking uh, uh, more 
more funding to uh, uh, help them put this uh, money to use for the projects. So they still haven't given up. We still need more help. You know, to John's point, Mark, I think one of the most exciting things about the infrastructure laws of about 3.5 of that 22 billion that John talked about that goes directly to the Indian Health Service. Since the 1970s, IHS, which is a division of, of Health and Human Services, has kept a list called their Sanitation Facilities Construction List that shows every one of the projects on a federally recognized tribal reservation that needs funding for water and sanitation, everything from, you know, like a treatment plant to a community bathroom. And they've kept this list. And for generations now, to John's point, Congress has only appropriated a small amount. I think at most, maybe 4% of the list, not even enough to keep up with the growth in the list year over year. And this bipartisan infrastructure bill, the IIJA, is really exciting because Congress just funded and, and has now appropriated the funds for that entire backlog, that whole $3.5 billion, which now IHS has a giant job of trying to wipe out over the next five years with the help of tribal government. Um, and holding government you know, accountable and responsible, there's some incredible people in these agencies, but holding them responsible and helping ensure that this money gets where it's needed and that these projects get completed is a really important thing. It's not enough just to pass the bill. We have to pay attention now. We have to support tribes in this work and give them the flexibility they need. I think one of the constant tragedies when we look at, at federal funding is that federal dollars can't be used on operations and maintenance for water systems. It can only be used to build new water systems or build new connections. And, you know, we know from the IHS's own research that every dollar we invest in a water system in Indian country creates $20 in economic benefit by just reducing disease. Um, and helping people, you know, go to work and go to school. And, you know, if that's true, if for every dollar we invest, we get 20 back on native reservations, we really should be looking at more flexible ways of funding and trusting these tribes with the money and with the appropriations they need to do that work. You know, it strikes me that the appropriations process is so much also about uh, power and independence, right? You know, there's, there's the old saw about starving the beast, meaning don't fund don't fund government. But uh, in this respect, if you take a look at the various nations and you you look at the fact that these are independent governments or semi-independent governments, um, we fund states and we empower local government and local government empowers itself um, through this sort of exchange of wealth. But if you, if you starve um, the beast and the beast that you're talking about is a tribal government, basically you're disempowering. Um, and so you're empowering certain people, you're choosing who to empower, you're choosing who to disempower. And then you promulgate a system which we're looking at just statistically looks completely unjust, right? I mean, it's 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 on the face of it. It doesn't matter if you're if you're white looking on, black looking on, native looking on, Latino, you know, diverse Asian uh, communities. You just look at this and it's just it, it just looks unjust. So uh, we're coming to the end of our of our of our uh, time here. Um, George, I'm going to go to you and then I'm going to I'm going to leave it with uh, John, give you the last word. How do we solve this issue, uh, George, so that and I'll just look at the uh, Navajo Nation as a as an example. How do we resolve this so that we are we do not have 30 percent of the members of the Navajo Nation without a tap or running water within homes? How do we deal with that? That is the, the multi-billion dollar question. Um, I think the first step is to acknowledge that we have this massive water access gap in the U.S. and, and build some collective- Do we also acknowledge that it. we have a collective obligation to fix it? Yeah, I, that's the, yeah, that's exactly the second half of that thought, that we do have an obligation to solve it. Um, and you know that will require the federal government and legislators stepping up and recognizing this as a problem and, and putting legislation in place to solve it. But I think, you know, if we're really going to solve it, especially on a place like Navajo, um, to your point and to John's today, it's really going to be about putting these communities back in the center of decision making. You know, other communities, predominantly white communities throughout our nation's history have been given the funding and the license and the decision making power to lead, you know, to lead this process themselves and to say like, we need, we need this access and this system in this place. And it's created, to your point, a tremendous amount of wealth, often extractive wealth. Um, and what we need today is to, you know, put these same impacted communities, whether it's a tribal community or a rural white community in Appalachia or, 
you know, a Latino farm working community along the US Mexico border, we need to put them back in the driver's seat and give them the same access to unfettered resources like grant, not loan money, um, and money for operations and maintenance that we did to predominantly white communities for the last hundred years. So part of this systems change is a change in ourselves, recognizing the rights of others. Uh, John, we also have other aspects of the system change. It's not only about goodwill. It's about it's about uh, power and orchestrated uh, change that changes institutions. Um, what what other advice do you have for us in terms of how all of us together can create the country that we we want to have? Well, we've got momentum now with the bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill that we talked about. We just need to build on that, and and, and we're doing that. These uh, 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 funds for operation and, and maintenance that uh, George referred to, that's very, very important. So we're all working on that now, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, be successful in Congress. It's just uh, too bad that it took uh, the COVID uh, epidemic to point out all these problems in Indian country. Uh, with uh, with access to water, but uh, we've got their attention now, and we need to follow up and, and uh, turn that uh, attention into uh, uh, more support for our tribal communities. We're we're all bound together as one nation, right? I mean, and and um, that that we uh, tolerate a lack of access to clean water is is something that doesn't speak well of those of us who have access uh, to water. Uh, John Echohawk, Executive Director of the Native American Rights Fund and George McGraw, founder and CEO of Dig Deep. Thank you so much for helping us to understand this very complex problem, but a problem with a solution. Uh, John, your, your, um, your ideas, uh, George, your ideas are just uh, so instructive and please thank your staffs, your boards, uh, your peoples um, and and those who support and fund you uh, for helping to make this day possible. Uh, thank you so much. Everybody stay safe. And uh, incidentally, on Thursday, we're going to be talking about a totally different topic, totally different. It's going to be about the science and treatment of a type of cancer, colorectal cancer, which uh, uh, is the third largest um, uh, killer uh, cancer killer in the United States, and it affects um, uh, uh, predominantly um, as well um, uh, African American and uh, Native American uh, uh, populations. So uh, please stay tuned on Thursday. Thank you all, John, George. We really appreciate your your time. Thank you, Mark. Have a great day.